We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel. We've got extra copies. If you didn't bring one, you'd like one to follow along, raise your hand up real high, and uh, someone will be glad to drop one off. We've got a few over here on this side. And uh, anybody else, raise your hand up real high and uh, just keep it up till they come along. John chapter 16, verses 1 through 15 for today. I'll remind you, this is uh, right after the... Uh, Last Supper in the upper room, Jesus is en route, we believe, with his disciples walking uh, out of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley up to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he will be uh, betrayed, he'll be arrested, he'll be dragged before a couple of uh, uh, trials and, and courts and uh, scourged and uh, as well nailed to a cross and then burst forth from the tomb uh, three days later. But he's been preparing his disciples all along the way. And uh, this passage that we're going to study today uh, divides uh, thematically anyway uh, at between verses, what we call verses four and five. So I want you to uh, be thinking, uh, we'll read the first four, make a few comments along the way, and then take that uh, second uh, section on its own, but here Jesus is preparing them for some of the hostility and animus these disciples are going to have to endure uh, as his followers because they follow Jesus. Um, The folks that have been after Jesus, and we know they've actually been thinking murderous thoughts about Jesus, some of the self-righteous religious leaders of the day. And he has been taking the front of all of that, and uh, now he's telling his disciples, I'm going to go away. And so that will now fall on them, and he wants to prepare them for that and make sure that they're equipped. You'll see as we go through. But his first concern is what we call verse 1 of chapter 16. These things I've spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling, not that you may be kept from dying, Not that you may be kept from being persecuted, not that you may be kept from suffering, but that you may be kept from stumbling. Jesus' first concern is apostasy, the falling away, and he wants his disciples to know as they begin to follow him that it will look like something and it will cost them something. It's not just a sort of happy, clappy kind of religious thing that he's starting where everybody just smiles and You know, it's kind of a Cheshire cat smile all the time for the rest of your life because you're a Jesus follower. You're actually going to endure some of what he endured. You're actually going to go through some of what he has gone through. He would even say to them um, a little bit later here that they're going to go through, not, not when, but or not if rather, but when you go through tribulation, you can be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Um, That's a pretty amazing thing for anyone to say. Sign up to follow me, and actually, it's going to involve some suffering. It's going to involve some stuff, and I don't want you to fall. Oh, I don't want you to fall is what he says. Verse 2, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. You see the inversion of right thinking there? We even have that in our own day as well. They think that they're doing a service to God by trying to silence you, you who are followers of Jesus, is what he's saying to those who are literally on the ground with him right now. And he's basically saying there, yeah, even from the religious sector will come this. They'll be thrown out of the synagogue. Notice how he emphasizes that even more than he would. He's not even talking politically so much here. He says, you're going to be thrown out of the synagogue. Well, understand for them, that meant a lot more than if I were just to say to you, you know, you're not welcome to come back to the village chapel, you know, because of what's going on in your life or the choices you're making or whatever. If we were to ask you not to come back, that's a lot different than in their day and age, in their day and time when their religious life was so wrapped up in every quadrant of their, their lives, business, Could they buy food? Could they, you know, their social relationships? Um, You know, if you stopped coming to church, probably there aren't a lot of people that would necessarily, you know, it it wouldn't cost you your job. You'd still be able to go to the Kroger and buy some groceries. These guys, not so much. It would cost them quite a bit to be thrown out of the synagogue. That's why we saw that earlier on in the gospel records, that some of them were afraid that they would be cast out of the synagogue. And for fear of that, they didn't publicly declare they're following Jesus. These things they will do because, verse 3, they have not known the Father or me. 
In other words, they don't recognize God, and they certainly didn't recognize Jesus as God's Messiah, and so it's unbelief that is at the heart of their hostility and their animus toward the followers of Jesus. Unbelief is indeed at the heart of all of my sin as well as all of your sin, and we simply get to that place where we say, God, I don't trust you with this or with that. I don't trust you to be the one that decides this or that. I don't trust you with my future. I don't trust you with my past. I don't think you can really forgive me. There's so many areas where unbelief kicks in and then we start doubting God or not believing God is who God says he is. And it's real important to Jesus that we not stumble in that, that we would with confidence and along with the psalmist, even though we go through great trials and tribulations, every time you see a lament in the psalms, it seems, those psalms seem to end with some vote of confidence in who God is. Yet will I trust you. Yet will I believe. Even as the psalmist lays out the horrific circumstances of being chased by an enemy with a sword and arrows, yet will I trust you. Verse 4, but these things I've spoken to you that when your hour comes, their hour comes rather, you may remember that I told you of them and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. In other words, I was with you absorbing the hit, all of that hostility coming at us coming at me. I was with you, but now I'm not going to be with you anymore. And so I want you to know something. This is an experience that you're going to have. And he's about to talk about from verses 5 to 15, the second theme of this passage that we're studying today, which is the Holy Spirit. And some of you are going, oh, okay. Now, how many of you raised in charismatic Pentecostal churches? Anybody here at all? Come on, be brave. It's okay. You're among friends. How many of you are raised in frozen chosen settings? Come on. Oh, my goodness. Look at all of us. Okay, yeah. All right, so that's good. All right, well, we need to loosen up a little bit, okay? So uh, <laughs> um, this is awesome. I mean, if you wondered what Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit, if you wonder what the Bible does really say about the Holy Spirit, I mean, I've been in settings before. I've been in all kinds of settings before you know, over the course of my life, and, and, and some of you have as well. And I know some of your stories, and I know some of you, you know, that, that uh, some of the wild stuff you've experienced before, as have I. And I also know some of you, some of the really dull stuff you've experienced. <laughs> and so if I, too, where they just basically say, dude, check your emotions at the door. When you come here, fold your hands and just don't even exhibit any kind of emotion whatsoever. Let us pump you with data, and then we'll send you back out because you got the proper data. You'll be able to do, you know, do a good job representing God. Well, man, I, it's a little hard when some people go out back out into the world, and all they've got is a sour, dour demeanor. It's a little hard to think the Holy Spirit's really got a hold of them and is actually transforming their life and filling them with the joy of Jesus. At the same time, we all recognize when somebody's just faking it and somebody's sort of... I don't know, just the inauthenticity of, of, of what their claims are. It doesn't seem like they actually believe it and are, are sort of, uh, you know, our, our, our guess at whether or not they really and honestly believe what they're saying it doesn't seem to be real. So look with me at what we are, what Jesus teaches about the Holy Spirit. And this is just one of the occasions where he says something about the Holy Spirit. We saw some uh, in chapter 14 as well, but this is awesome. There's about 10 things in here about the Holy Spirit that Jesus makes real clear. You might want to, I'll throw some things up on the screen for you, but you might want to just, as we read this passage, you might want to just be asking yourself, there's a characteristic of the Holy Spirit. There's, so this is what Jesus wanted his disciples to know about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send him, oh, he uses a personal pronoun. Anybody notice that? That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is male in gender. It means the Holy Spirit is personal, not impersonal. Okay? I know we have a lot of conversation about gender and all that sort of thing these days, but I think when we when we have Jesus teaching us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, this is the way God has chosen to reveal himself. Uh, I don't think that means that, that God is limited to the male gender. I think he transcends all of that, but so that we understand that God is personal, he uses personal pronouns and personal images, human images. I mean, the Bible talks all the time about God's right hand. You know, I mean, do I think God actually has a right hand or do I think that represents his power to take action 
and do things. I think he has more than a right hand, but I think he wants us to know that he can take action. Um, and yes, he might have a right hand. I don't know. I just know his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. are higher than all of my ways and all of my thoughts. And so I have him. Now, Jesus is telling me that the Holy Spirit is a him, uh, is personal. And he's, uh, uh, now I'm going to him, the Father who sent me, okay? And none of you ask me, where are you going? Well, some of you are going, yes, they did ask that. In chapter 13, verse 36, chapter 14, verse 5. What's that about, and is the Bible contradicting itself right now? I don't think so. This is a difficult passage in some ways to interpret and be able to answer all these questions. A lot of the people that I like to listen to, a lot of people that I like to read, uh, came to verse 5 and said, oh, I'm not really sure. What's he talking about here? How do you explain that? For me, the most satisfying is simply that in 1336 and in 4-5, a couple hours have gone by. Man, there's a lot of flow in conversation with people. I don't know if you've noticed that before. And, and, and it seems like in some instances, what the disciples really are concerned about, are, it, it seems, is the fact that they're going to be left alone and they're a little fearful that, he, that he's not going to prove to be the Messiah they thought he was. And they're going to be left alone. And he's saying, no, no, where I'm going is what's important. And it's because he's been saying, the one who sent me is God the Father. My source origin is heaven itself. I'm the son of God. He's tried to make it so clear to them over and over and over again. Um, and so none of you are asking me about that. You have sorrow, verse 6 says. I've said these things and you have sorrow. It's filled your heart. And there is a sorrow of uh, there is a sorrow of mystery, isn't there? Those of you that understand this, the Christian faith is this beautiful tapestry of, of, of both history and mystery. There, there are some, some aspects of it that we can point to and look and say, that's history. We can, we can figure that out. It, there's eyewitness testimony that it is, and this and this, this actually happened, you know? And then there's other aspects of it that are just a complete mystery to us. The Trinity, the incarnation, great mysteries. Uh, you know, and, and the, but yet really clear in the scriptures. And so there's sorrow that's filling their hearts because the Lord has been telling them that he's going to be leaving. But I tell you the truth, verse 7, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, here's this word parakletos again, the helper, meaning the Holy Spirit, shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. There's a bit right there of what we learn about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is, and the Father are going to send the Holy Spirit together. Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit are united. They're, they're a unity. They're a tri-unity. They're a trinity, if you will. And they have the same mission and the same message. And so when he goes away, they're not going to be left alone. Even though all that persecution is going to come their way and that animus and that hostility is going to come their way, they're not going to be left alone is what he's saying. To them. I'll tell you the truth, the one, the paracletos, the, the comforter, the one called alongside, it's a very rich word, and it means uh, it, 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 some of your English translations will, will use the comforter or, or the, the helper uh, to translate that paracletos. He, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. There's so much there that the Holy Spirit is going to do. And yet, there's nothing there about swinging from a chandelier or jumping over a pew. There's nothing there about what a whole lot of people make a whole lot of noise about when it comes to the Holy Spirit in our day and time. But yet, man, the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to convict us concerning sin? Yeah. And righteousness? Yeah. And judgment? Yes. And y'all are sitting there and go, he's nuts. Why is he excited about judgment? Because the only one who really knows what is righteous and the only one who really can say with any authority whatsoever what is sin is the one who will have the last word. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. Why? 
because I don't like injustice and I don't like the brokenness of this world and I don't like hate and, and I, don't, I don't like the selfishness in my own heart and the darkness in my own heart and I hope that someday God will do something about all that stuff. And that's what judgment means. He will set things right that are not right. We ought to be singing, hallelujah, what a judgment. <laughs> and looking forward to it. Because it means that what is wrong will be set right finally. I'm excited about that. And it may make me sound crazy. But I'm excited about it. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of the world has been judged. In other words, the verdict is in. The sovereign God of the universe, the creator and rightful ruler of all that exists, will have the final word. And if, folks, if you trust him with your eternity, you are in good hands. You are in good hands. I have many more things, Jesus says, that I would say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I, I, that's my life verse right there, okay? <laughs> I cannot bear them right now. I mean, I'm a little overjoyed at the stuff I do understand, and I'm a little overwhelmed by some of the stuff that I don't understand much at all because it's, it's mind-blowing, and I can't bear it right now, some of it. And I got to be honest, especially when it's concerning conviction of sin, I can't bear that so easy all the time in my own life. Maybe you can't, maybe if you're honest, you would say that as well. So when I sin, when I break myself against God's laws, when I go against his creation designed for humanity, when I go against God's revealed will in scripture, or Holy Spirit convicting me concerning righteousness. What's righteousness? It's seeing things the way that God sees things and wanting what God wants. Righteousness. It's rightness. So the Holy Spirit comes to, in the middle of even our culture right now, which is intellectually confused and morally bankrupt, which is falling at the altar of the most tepid relativism I've ever seen, doesn't even, I mean, it's so confused, so darkened our world is. We need the light of the Holy Spirit to come and convict us concerning those things that are at odds with God's laws, but also considering, con concerning those things that are right, that God wants us to see and do and embrace so that we can tell the difference between you know, when we need to tap the brakes and when we need to roll down the window and, and, and sing at the top of our lungs and when we need to hit the gas pedal and where we need to steer the car. Just to use a simple little metaphor, I need the direction of the Holy Spirit in my life and so do you. I was talking to my mom, my mom about this, you know, about the Holy Spirit and how does she experience the Holy Spirit. And she said a couple things. She said he, 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 when he convicts me of sin, it's, it's like he's saying... He, it's a red flag of, uh, against temptation. Don't flirt with that temptation. Don't flirt with that temptation. And there we are, all of us, we just flirt away with temptation. You know? Some of you nodding your heads, you know exactly what I mean. Um, it, it, you find yourself opening the door of opportunity to do something you know the Lord has, it doesn't please the Lord, or you know the Lord has said, that's, that's pretty out of bounds for you. As my people, you want to live in such a way that honors me. You want to live in such a way that's, that's in keeping with God's design for your life and your relationships and your, your work ethic and, and your, your citizenry and all that stuff and just being a family man, all that stuff. You want to live to honor God, then God has drawn some really good boundaries for us. And they're very clear. Um, my ethics professor used to say, we really don't need to work very hard as preachers at telling people what is right and, and what is wrong. It's pretty clear in the Scripture. We should work a little harder at encouraging people to discern the difference and to want to do what is right. And he, he was right on about that. But here's the Holy Spirit's job. And I don't know about you, but I, I have, how many of you would confess right now, I've actually tried to play the role of the Holy Spirit in someone else's life? Raise your hand if that's you. Okay, and raise the hand. If you're sitting next to the person that's done that to you, raise your hand. No, don't do that. Don't do that. 
Oh, no, do not do that, do not. Boy, it's gonna be a tough lunch today. Um, I'm terrible at, and you know, my family members, my neighbors, my, my friends, my coworkers, they'll all tell you, yeah, Jim's a really bad Holy Spirit. He's not even a good Holy Spirit. He's not even a good spirit, not even a kind spirit sometimes, you know? So we're really bad at being the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit's really great at being the Holy Spirit. My mom says he's, he, he, he's good at warning us about sin and encouraging us also to be, be in the moment, looking for what he might want us to do in the moment. You know, she was telling me about, about the Lord told her to watch for the mailman on one particular day and, and to, be, to say a kind word to that person, you know. She said, That's fine. I said, well, what'd you do? And she said, I sat there and he was late. I had to wait a whole hour. <laughs> I, she, I said, well, did you wait for him? Yeah, I waited for him. I said, so you, you gave that whole hour just to what the Lord wanted you to do in that moment that was completely, you know, just, just him talking, the Holy Spirit talking to you. She said, yeah. I said, man, I got to be more aware of the dynamic of the presence of the Spirit leading and guiding me through my everyday life in everyday ways with, with everyday people like myself, like, like the mailman, like the person at the grocery store. And Jesus says, there's so many things I would like to tell you about all of this, verse 12. Now look, look you could put one through 12 uh, uh, items on verses 13, 14, 15, because they're, they're, and you don't have to, but if you wanted to, there's just, he's going to back the truck up and tell us a lot of characteristics of the Holy Spirit right here. Uh, but when he, and there's a personal pronoun about the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, oh, there's another thing he tells us about the Holy Spirit, comes, there's another thing he tells us about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to come. Those of us who studied the book of Acts together, which we have done, you're welcome to go up online. You can download all of those Bible studies. If you want chapter two, the Holy Spirit comes in a brand new way. And all those guys who followed Jesus for three and a half years stood on the ground with him uh, when he raised people from the dead, saw him uh, cast demons out, saw him heal people of all kinds of diseases, uh, and, and even saw him raise three people from the dead as well as get up out of the grave himself. All of those people had still not quite enough for Jesus to say, go out now, this is it, you're ready. No, he told them before he ascended back to heaven, he said, wait for the coming of the Spirit, the promise of the Father. They weren't ready to be his witnesses just yet, even though they had been with him for what would surely have been way better than any seminary education anybody today could get because they walked and talked with Jesus. They weren't ready. So they wait, they wait, they wait, and then Acts chapter 2, here comes the Holy Spirit. Not just upon them, but comes to live within them, as Jesus distinguished a little bit earlier in John's gospel for us. And so when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And the idea there is just like Jesus said, I, I don't speak on my own initiative. I speak what the Father tells me to speak. So again, the unity of the Trinity in the message that is being taught to us. He will disclose to you what is to come. This is a dynamic relationship. Verse 14, he shall glorify me. You see, the Holy Spirit isn't about glorifying himself. And man, you wouldn't know that in some local churches and in some big events that people put on nowadays and watching some TV shows. You wouldn't know that. You'd think the Holy Spirit was about glorifying the Holy Spirit. And here he says, no, the Holy Spirit is actually going to be glorifying me, meaning Jesus. So if you think whatever the Holy Spirit is doing, if you think some, the Holy Spirit is doing something and it isn't glorifying Jesus, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. He's about glorifying Jesus. And he says it right here very clearly. For he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. And all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. There's so much here. And I'm going to have to just fly through this material. First of all, he doesn't want you to fall. He doesn't want me to fall. Chesterton said there are an infinity of angles at which you can fall. Only one at which you can stand. Do you realize what's going on right now? You know, in, in, in my feet alone... Medically, some of you medical professionals could actually tell me how many hundreds of little bones and muscles are working together with just between my toes, my feet, 
my, maybe my calves or whatever, for me and my ears, you know, my balance and all that stuff. How, what all is going into me just being able to stand is just amazing. It's so beautiful, complex design. And when you, when you stand, those of you that can say, the same thing is true of you. There's a lot of ways, I mean, in which we could fall, but only one at which we can stand, spiritually speaking. There's a lot of things out there in your world and in my world that would trip me up or would trip you up. And Jesus is just beautifully clear with his disciples as he talks about what could happen to them as they are about to go through the kind of hostility and persecution that they're going to go through. When he gets right to the question, who is the Holy Spirit? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? What's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? What are the gifts of the Spirit? You've heard about all these things before. Um, um, we, we've studied uh, Galatians. We've studied the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. Um, we've studied uh, 1 Corinthians. We've looked at, at some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm going to do a flyover in just a second here. If you, if you, if you, this will all be up on the, on the website, so you don't have to you know, try to keep up if, you, if you're a note taker. But in the, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit comes upon people for special dispensations and events. So he comes upon them. The Spirit come, of God comes upon Elijah or whatever it might be, and, and something or, or other happens. The word used for spirit is ruach in the Hebrew. It means uh, breath, wind, or Spirit of God. Uh, but even the creation event in uh, Genesis chapter 1, it's the Spirit of God, the ruach of God that hovers over the waters like a, like a hen hovering over some eggs. And the, and the Spirit of God that's mentioned even in Revelation Back at the very end of our Bibles. Uh, so from beginning to end, the Spirit of God is mentioned over and over hundreds of different times, sometimes referred to as the Spirit, sometimes it's referred to as the Holy Spirit, sometimes the Spirit of God. But hundreds of times from beginning to end in the New Testament, the word is pneuma, and it too means wind, spirit, or breath. The Holy Spirit has been so important, um, and, and I've got to keep keep flying through this material, but the Holy Spirit is so important in the church, and I don't know if you understand just how important the Holy Spirit is in your life, but I hope to stir you up a little bit to think about that as I have been stirred up a little bit more this week uh, in my own studies and in, in conversations with others. Uh, A.W. Tozer said about the early church, if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop, and everyone would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on, and no one would know the difference. Oh, ouch. You know, he wrote that in the 1960s. What do you think he would say today? That's convicting. You know, we're really good at the dog and pony show of religion, aren't we? Um, we really know how to how to put on programs and things like that. But it's the Spirit of God at work here. Or are we just rearranging the stuff on the altar and there's no sign of holy fire in sight? These are good questions for people in leadership as well as people who come and are a part of a church to ask themselves. And that's been a soul-searching thing to, and, a, and a very convicting thing in many different ways. What does the Bible say the Holy Spirit does? Well, he's creative, involved in creation event. We see that in Genesis 1. We're, we've already seen in John 14 and John 16, he's intelligent and has knowledge, leads and guides us into the truth. Um, he, again, has knowledge and reveals what God wants us to know, 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, Holy Spirit has feelings and emotions, Ephesians 4. Holy Spirit can be known, John 14. Um, the Holy Spirit is God and has identified himself with God the Father and, 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 and uh, with Jesus himself, Matthew 28. The Holy Spirit empowers believers for witness. Uh, lying to the Holy Spirit is the same thing as lying to God, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. You guys know that story, most of you do. Holy Spirit conveys power of God through his servants and messengers, Romans 15. Has privilege and intimate knowledge of God that he passes along to us, which is wonderful. He's the indwelling presence of God in the believer. Oh, that's so wonderful. It dispenses spiritual gifts. Um, and if you don't know what yours are, man, go on a search. Let's 
Just contact us. We'll help you. We'll point you to some materials that, that you can begin to, to explore how it is the Lord might want to use you in the body of Christ and in the world as you join God in the mission that he has in this world. Holy Spirit unites us with Christ in salvation. This is so wonderful. Don't miss this, your union with Christ. It's, it's at the center of the Christian faith. It's so important to us. We don't just worship God out there, that object in the sky somewhere in the universe, but we are united with God in Christ. We are united with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When we, when we baptize folks, that's what we're, we're physically displaying that and symbolizing that they are united with Christ in his death and in his burial, and then we bring them up out of the water and in the resurrection as well to new life in Christ. It's really powerful. It's really beautiful. The Holy Spirit is involved in regeneration and renewal of sinners. Somebody should say amen there. You need a little renewal? Get on your knees, man. Pray. Lord, come. Renew me. Take this crusty heart of mine. I'm dry. I'm despairing. You know, please come. Renew us. We talk around here, we talk about the ba- there's one baptism of the Holy Spirit. He baptizes you into the body of Christ. But there are many fillings of the Holy Spirit. We see that in the book of Acts as well. It says multiple times that Peter stood up and he was filled with the Spirit and he spoke. More than once he was filled with the Spirit. Why is that? Because we leak. <laughs> I need a refill. I turned my back on him. I went my own way. I did something under my own steam and power. And now I need to get back on my knees before him, lift up the empty hands of faith, and receive from him again the power to resist sin or be convicted of sin, to be convinced by the Holy Spirit that such such and such a thing is sin, such and such a thing is righteousness. Or to simply renew my hope that one day the judgment is coming and God is going to set things right. And I need that hope. I need, that, I need to be stirred up to that as well. And I'm so glad he does all of that. He's involved in the inspiration of Scripture. He's involved in salvation, does the work of sanctification. I need a lot of that. Preserves believers with the divine seal of the promise. Oh, isn't that great? Uh, the, the seal of his promise, the symbol of ownership, belonging, and security. He will hold you fast, we sing. It's not up to me to hold him fast. He holds me fast. He holds you fast. I let go all the time, and so do you. I'm distracted all the time, and yet he's got his eye on me. And I can trust him and hope in him. He comes to convict the world concerning at least these three things. And by the way, aren't you glad that, you know, because the Bible calls the devil the accuser of the brethren. Remember that? The Holy Spirit isn't coming to accuse you of sin. He's coming to convict you of sin. How much richer and deeper is that? I mean, I can just accuse myself all the time. You, you, some of you guys that were raised in performance-based settings all the time, you know when you've messed up. You are shamed. You feel it. You don't need more accusations. You need conviction that what God says is true. That's right. He's right about the fact that I flirted with temptation and caved. And he's right about the fact that Jesus paid it all. And he's right about the fact that if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from how much? Unrighteousness. And so we come to the table to say thank you and joyfully repent because he has already told us what the answer is and who it's found and it's found in Christ. Merrill Tenney said, the spirit doesn't merely accuse us of sin, brings us to the inescapable sense of guilt so that we can realize our shame and helpfulness before God. It points us, it points us to our need of a savior, you see? Conviction points me, I can't do this on my, I need Jesus, I need what he does. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, he convicts us of righteousness. As David Wells says, worldliness is what any particular culture does to make sin look normal and righteousness look strange. Oh, 
Man, he said that a few years ago too. I wonder what, if he were here right now, I'd love to talk to him about what do you, what do you think about this now? Because this is, what he's saying is, just what happens in, in John chapter 16, when those people get it in their head that they're doing God a favor by silencing the followers of Jesus. We got the same thing going on in this world right now. It's upside down and inside out in so many ways, you know? And we need the work of the Holy Spirit to come and to set us free and to point us in the right direction of God's righteousness and make it look like what we want to do. I don't know when that started happening in our culture. I know in my lifetime, there has been the deconstruction of language that I lament. It's so sad. That bad became good. That wicked meant awesome. You know, somebody came up to me after the last worship service and said, bro, that was a wicked sermon. <laughs> and I said, I think I know what you're trying to say. Um, but that's a lamentable thing that we've gone to that, that degree where we have, the world has made sin look normal and righteousness look, righteousness look strange. And then that judgment again. Um, uh, Lewis says there's really just two kinds of people in the world. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, your will be done then. Because if what you want, if you're here today, and you, as you think about God and you think about Christ and you think about the grace of God that's on offer to you, if what you want is for God to just leave you alone and to not exist, the God of the Bible will actually give you what you want. What could be more fair than that? If you say, I don't want you, I don't want you to be God, I don't want what you have on offer, I'm not interested in Jesus. You're doing the exact same thing that some of those religious leaders did in Jesus' day and time. You're saying no. Why, why isn't it fair of God then to simply give you what you want? And at some point, his likeness in your life will begin to fade. And your love for that which is self-destructive will in increase. Your love for darkness will increase. Your inability to say no to sin and yes to righteousness will grow weaker and weaker and weaker. And some of you know people that are right there now, but let's not, look, let's not think about them right now. Let's wave the red flag about me and you right now um, and ask the Holy Spirit to be speaking to us. The great Christian revolutions, Niebuhr said, come not by the discovery of something that was not known before. They happen when somebody takes radically something that has always been there. How about us? Let's take this radically. Let's take seriously the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's be awakened to that as we go to the restaurant this afternoon and as we go home with our family today. As we go to work tomorrow, I and mean, we think about our work ethic, and, and how, do, how can we honor God in all of these settings, that, different settings that we have? By the way, what Jesus is talk, talking about right here in John chapter 16 um, had been prophesied a long time ago. The Lord, through the prophet Ezekiel, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. Does any of that look interesting to you? Do you have a heart of stone today? Or do you have a, a heart that's calloused over? Lewis used to say every time we say no to God, we're essentially callousing over our conscience. Does that, hap that happen to you? Um, it has happened to me before. I'm so glad for the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in my life as I consider this passage today and in this particular week. We'll close with this quote from Oz Guinness. With the Holy Spirit resting upon us as Jesus promised, our part is to host, listen, the very presence of God wherever we are, to exercise the very power of God in every situation, and to witness to the gospel and what God has done in Jesus and is doing in the world today. The call to be witnesses is central and decisive from uh, Oz's book, Fool's Talk. Really great book. I recommend you read it sometime if you get a chance. Um, so here we are today. Here you are in your journey. You're the only one. I, I, I don't know everybody in the room. There's no way I could possibly know where you're at in your journey with Christ. But wherever you might be at, I hope to stir you up to persuade you the Holy Spirit wants to live large in your life 
And, uh, and he wants you to uh, surrender to his transforming power in your life. He wants you to dial in, tune in your, the ears of your heart, the eyes of your heart to his voice and to his leading and guiding. And I hope and pray that would be the case for each and every one of us. Let's close in prayer. This is the prayer of John Stott where he includes a prayer to the Holy Spirit. It goes like this. Heavenly Father, we worship you as creator and sustainer of the universe. Lord Jesus, we worship you, Savior, Lord of the world. Holy Spirit, we worship you, sanctifier of the people of God. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray that we may live this day in your presence and please you more and more, Lord Jesus, that this day we may take up our cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, that this day you would fill us with yourself, cause your fruit to ripen in our lives. May the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control of the Holy Spirit bloom in our lives. Holy, blessed, glorious Trinity, three persons in one God. Have mercy on us, we pray. Amen and amen.